Here we go, extracting and using space resources. So this session, we're going to find out more about the latest science and technology advancements for the extraction of space resources and potential uses. The first part of the session is going to be chaired by Mahar Kalaji, who is just standing here in the wings, and the second uh, by Abigail, I believe, if that's correct. Yes, yeah. so Abigail, who you've met before, of course, but Mahar, you haven't met yet. A little bit about Professor Mahar Kalaji. He's known for his research in electro catalysis and developing chemical sensors for security, health and environmental applications. Also, he's a member of the board of directors of the Asteroid Foundation, which of course is celebrated at the end of June every year, and we are a base here in Luxembourg. You're very welcome to come and join us for Asteroid Day. Uh, the Luxembourg-based foundation aims to work closely together with various schools, has an increasing educational focus, uh, space sector industries, organizations to connect people worldwide to the foundation's network of ast astronauts and experts so that we can can inspire, inspire future generations. Apologies, I was out quite late last night. Not as late as some people, <laughs> but later than I was expecting to be. So there we go. That's a small introduction. And uh, of course, I must also add that year on year, in the few years that Space Resources Week has been running, I am so impressed by the number of young faces that we have in the audience. I mean, it makes me feel like I'm getting old, but uh, we have a, an increasing number of young faces in the audience. And um, I spoke to a number of them last night. I can't see them here. <laughs> Maybe they'll come in later in the day, but, but some, I mean, it's great to see PhD students here as well. So we've got a, a whole range. So welcome, welcome, and we're happy to have more next year. With that, it's over to you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Lisa, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, away from the smooth good morning voice to the wake up good morning voice now. And for those who are not here, you don't know what you're missing. You really are, do not know what you're missing because this session is really about the mother of all the holy grails of space exploration. Because unless if we do not change our DNA reversibly over the next few years to enable us to live in harsh conditions, then we have to rely on what's being presented over the next uh, two hours or so. These people have done some work which is really revolutionary, not evolutionary, but revolutionary. And you'll be lis listening to some really excellent presentations. Can I ask all the speakers once they've finished, once they've obeyed all the rules regarding the uh, sticking to the time, is to sit here so as we can have some time afterwards for a, a quick discussion and quick uh, uh, session of questions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Victoria Levy from the Open University in the UK. And she'll be talking about updates on the development of CubeSat compatible systems to uh, supplement lunar prece uh, preceding missions. So please join us on stage. Thank you. All right, then, good morning, everyone. Thank you to everybody who is here. My voice might be a little bit croaky because I'm a little bit on the tired side this morning. Um, but we'll see how we get on, and hopefully more people will join us throughout the session. So I am representing my PhD project, and I work out of the Open University, which is in Milton Keynes in the UK. And I will say before we start, special thanks to the UK Space Agency, as they provided funding for me to be here today. So thank you to them. Okay, so the concept behind my project then was the development of a tool to assist with ISRU operations on the lunar surface, whilst also providing the opportunity of having access to that lunar material, that regolith, to also achieve science goals. So it's sort of working with that synergy, which we've been talking about a lot this week, between science and ISRU. And we heard a lot, especially on the first day, about the importance of resource evaluation in the early stages of ISRU, so we know exactly what's there, exactly what we can make use of on the lunar surface. And we also heard about the importance of lunar volatiles as a resource, especially lunar water, which is going to be really key to us being able to set up that permanent human presence 
targets, which is the eventual goal of um, most of the major space agencies at the moment. And what we really need is to be able to do some ground truth evaluation of the volatiles. So being able to do this in situ means that we can verify the findings of remote sensing missions, and we just have much, much more information, many more pieces of the puzzle, so we know exactly what we're dealing with. Scientifically speaking, being able to study these volatiles in situ means we can learn more about their origin and evolution. So for example, one of the objectives of my work is being able to look at the hydrogen deuterium ratio of water samples. And what that can do is it can give us insight into the origin of those water samples. So we can compare them to other water across the solar system and we can sort of draw a comparison on where those, um, those quantities of water might have come from, might have originated from. That's one of the big outstanding science questions that a lot of the major space players have identified as well, so that's excellent. In terms of ISRU, obviously having a better idea of the abundance of volatiles on the lunar surface is really important, but also learning more about how they move across the surface and also um, how, how they evolve over time is going to be really important to learning about how sustainable they are as an actual resource? Is it something which is not going to be replenished? Is it something that we can kind of rely upon to um, be a bit more sustainable? You know, these are all questions that we still have to answer. So we know that the majority of water on the lunar surface is at the poles in these cold traps, permanently shadowed or shaded regions. But we do think there is likely to be water maybe trapped within the regolith across the wider surface itself. So this project, was to develop a device which is small enough and hopefully cheap enough so that you could replicate it, you could make lots of them, and you could deploy them anywhere that ISRU activities are likely to take place, anywhere you might find lunar water on, um, on the surface of the moon. We're aiming to have this compatible with the CubeSat form factor because that's a, a very widely used form factor in space engineering. Um, and you can see here on the slides this is what we've come up with so far. This is our analysis device. It's a miniature magnetic sector mass spectrometer, which is hard to say in what go at this time in the morning. This is it in situ. So this is within the vacuum chamber that we have it sitting in in the lab. And then you can see a CAD rendering just there on the left-hand side. And when I say miniature, it is, it is miniature. I've brought a model here today, so it's teeny-weeny for you to be able to see from where you're sitting. But you can come and find us um, at the UK Space Agency stand and you can have a closer look there if you want to. But for this analysis device, we've got different aims. So we want to be able to do that isotopic analysis, the deuterium-hydrogen uh, ratios. We obviously want to be able to have a look and see how much water there is within a sample, what type of water that is. And also, there is um, the option that this could be used for ISRU and ISRU-adjacent process monitoring as well. So things like... Um, uh, leak detection or maybe environmental monitoring too. So at the moment, the system is operable and it's very much in the kind of testing phase. So we're trying to figure out what it can do and that is basically based on what we would like it to be able to do. So it needs to fit into a CubeSat form factor, so it needs to be small. It needs to have low mass and low power requirements to operate on the lunar surface. So in terms of the mass at the moment, I weighed it the other day and it was about 700 grams, the mass spec itself, so it's, it is pretty wee and pretty light. Um, pie requirements, we're still determining those, so we'll have more information on that next year if we come back um, and give you an update then. Resolution-wise, it needs to be able to distinguish between those isotopic ratios and also we're looking to be able to distinguish, as I mentioned briefly, between different types of water. So not just molecular water, but also hydroxyl as well, because a lot of the remote sensing missions, they're not able to make that distinction, so you really need in situ um, devices to be able to do that. So at the moment, we've got a resolution of about eight. Um, we're looking to improve that to about 18, so we can do our water analysis, um, but it's, it's well on the way. The images you can see on the screen, this is just from some of the really early stage testing, basically what it's doing. Um, if you're not quite sure how a mass spectrometer works in this context, it takes a gaseous sample and then it splits it a little bit like a prism. So it splits it by mass into the different elements that are present. So this is just showing us what's in the lab air, basically. So lots of nitrogen, which is as you would expect. Nothing suspicious, which is good. Um, but we're hoping to 
improve these plots, improve the resolution, improve the sensitivity of it, and also reduce a lot of the noise that we still have in the system at present. Uh, the mass range I've popped in there at the moment, that again, it's still very much been determined, but basically we need to be able to detect everything that we might find on the lunar surface that might be of use, so all the useful volatiles. And also in terms of the process monitoring, um, you might want to look for things like CO2, you know, useful things that, that come out of whichever process it is that you are, um, that you're operating. So last but not least then, and I'll try and keep this brief. So the next stages are very much going to be in terms of system refinement. We want to work this towards a system which not only works, but is really good at what it does. So we'll be working on the resolution and we'll be working a lot on that noise reduction on the system to get some really nice plots um, of, of the mass peaks. And we're going to be working towards working with solid samples. So at the moment, we're taking in gaseous samples. What we really want to be able to do is to combine this with a heating system, a miniature heating system. So you can put in icy regolith samples, heat them up, release the volatiles, do all that in situ, all kind of in one go. So that's going to be the next kind of major step. And last but not least, there is the vision that this could be used as part of a larger system with a miniaturized extraction system like a drill or a robotic arm. So it can basically do all-in-one um, kind of extraction and analysis. I will note as well, just before I finish, that this project is about the lunar surface and about lunar water. But this is a technology that we envision being applicable to Mars, to asteroid um, prospecting, basically anywhere that you can go that needs a small scale, cheap, easily replicable type device that's able to analyze volatile type material. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll talk to you. Thank you so much uh, for that insightful presentation, Victoria. It really is very impressive. And one of the things that we have not discussed so far in this meeting is miniaturization. And miniaturization is really essential for payloads. And I'm really grateful for you for uh, highlighting that. Uh, water is extremely important, uh, not just for our survival, but also as a fuel there. And uh, mapping the surface of the moon for the presence of uh, water and uh, other species is uh, extremely important. And our next speaker is Jeff Plate from WGM Canada, who will be talking about the lunar geological depositional modeling insights for prospecting and exploration of water and also of volatile resources. So without any further ado, Jeff, can you please join us? Well, thank you and good morning, everybody. Uh, so well, before preparing for this, uh, this talk, I was uh, debating about how to change it up to make it a little more engaging. So I was thinking about doing some stand-up, so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, today my talk is going to be a little different from some of the other ones because I am a geologist. Uh, I work in the mining business. I do terrestrial exploration campaigns and recognize within my shop at WGM that there was a desperate need for first principles research on providing the prospecting and exploration tools so that the deployment of all of the fine equipment and technologies that a lot of us have seen in the last few days and throughout our careers in space uh, could be applied of where it goes. So I'm gonna focus on really applied science here uh, in discussing with you today. So next slide, please. So jumping right into the deep end, there we go. Uh, here's a picture of the lunar surface on the bottom uh, with some of the uh, early um, hydroxyl signatures for the water uh, on the uh, lunar surface. But really, I'm going to focus on not where it comes from, whether that's chondritis, uh, asteroids, comets, uh, anything like that. It's right there. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna focus on how it travels, how it moves around, because this is extremely important to figuring out where it ends up. So ultimately, what we're looking for is areas where water and volatile resources are concentrated, because that will tell you from a mission perspective where to go. So uh, to start with it, um, wherever you get uh, the water deposited, and especially where you're on the unlit portions of the moon over the course of a lunar day, uh, you will get these uh, sublimation and precipitation events that will occur over the course of time. And these particles will randomly jump in many directions throughout the lunar surface. However, they will continue to go through these cycles day after day, and I'm going to talk in geological time here, which is over hundreds of millions of years, not just days or years or things like that, um, on the surface. 
but there's definitely a number of effects that we've been able to identify that are very important for determining where the uh, biases are and which causes concentration for these species. So, some of the effects that uh, we've identified is, first of all, Coriolis effects. This is something that's caused by the natural curvature and the angular momentum that exists as the moon rotates along as a sphere. And it results in these particles moving generally on a biased basis on a curve down and away from the polar, or from the equ equatorial regions, down into the polar regions. So this has the effect of concentrating them into those areas where there are PSRs once it's remobilized due to the thermal flux from the day-night cycle. Uh, in addition, as the terminator comes along, it exerts a force because the volatiles, when they sublimate, are what we call ephemeral atmospheres. These are very, very thin and temporary uh, atmospheric conditions. We're talking at the pressures through most of the time, uh, one molecule per cubic meter. So a lot of the thermal effects and other things that you would expect here terrestrially don't exist there because you don't have any molecules to bump across to trade energy states um, within it. So the thermodynamics gets a little different uh, on the lunar surface. I often say to my uh, Earth science colleagues, that's what geologists refer to themselves as, as uh, we need to retrain ourselves because the Earth, or the Moon is not Earth. And that's an important differentiation in understanding how this works. Uh, but that solar energy coming in directionally acts as a sweeper almost and provides a force that drives uh, these particles both this way and then curving. And so that results in that bias that moves it towards the poles. So, something called geomorphology actually controls access to these permanently shadowed regions. So what is geomorphology for those of you who are not geologists? Well, that's the study of the shape of the terrain and can be very diagnostic in determining where things want to go. Um, and I'd like to also uh, extend uh, some thanks to my uh, business partners at Lunar Station. Uh, I know Dennis spoke yesterday afternoon uh, for the maps uh, and the details here that we can have. So what you're seeing up top here is something called a flow path. Uh, so that would be that squiggly orange line uh, from the edge of the crater, and that shows the most probable area where the water and volatiles will want to primarily uh, deposit through the PSR, and this is a function of ballistics and also uh, the shape of the terrain in making it the easiest way for it to, in effect, flow down. The easiest way for most people to visualize this is to think of it like water flowing downhill, because uh, it's something we're all familiar with. Um, and so the atmospheric and the gas, fluid gas dynamics is very similar uh, in terms of how it goes. So it will want to take the path of least resistance, and in fact, that's what that flow path is. Uh, to do so. So that's where the most likely spot, and this is all a probability game because no one's been down here yet uh, to find it, but it helps to explain why. Temperature plays an incredible role, as we all know, in whether or not the volatiles will stay put once it gets down there. So this is a confetti chart showing the max temperature in an actual crater, as Ibn Baya, which is our um, test sample crater for uh, uh, for demonstration purposes. Uh, the chart there is cut off a bit, but it's Calvin. So uh, the top of the chart, even though it's a red color, is basically the triple point for water on lunar surface conditions. So as you can see along that, uh, anywhere where you see that confetti area are areas of this particular crater where the temperature conditions at a maximum level are such that the water will stay put and the volatile species largely as well with it. So. One of the things that we've identified is that uh, the interaction as you go through that uh, freeze-thaw sublimate cycle is that uh, soil mechanics plays an incredibly important role in this. This is how the gas, the frost of these volatile species interact with the individual mineral grains. We believe that you will likely not find solid masses. Instead, we refer to it as frosted flakes. That is, you will have individual grains that are covered in a rind of frost uh, of some sort of volatile species, depending on where we're talking about. Ballistics, when it remobilizes, uh, has some very interesting effects. Uh, but what happens is it keeps bouncing until it hits first contact with cold regolith, and then it almost flash freezes um, and onto those grains and the rinds. 
The curious thing, though, is that due to some of the ballistics, some of the physical chemical properties as much as we know about them, because uh, a lot of this hasn't even been tested in laboratory conditions, so a lot of graphs and things for this go dot, dot, dot around zero atmospheric pressure and the temperatures we're talking about with it. But basically, they land in predictable areas along that flow path, distributed. It's not exactly a clean area, but it has some interesting um, effects as a result for potential mining and exploration operations because it segments the water and volatile species into very definable zones that blend into each other but have maximal areas where they are. And there's enough uh, distance between those individual areas uh, of dispersal that you could very easily target specific volatiles that you're looking for. In effect also, as an as an exploration and mining guy who does this, it can also vector you into the specific species you're looking for depending on how, they depo uh, how the deposition occurs. So putting this all together, uh, which we have done in partnership with Lunar Station, what you have here is a live 3D rendered probability map with the hotter colors being the most probable areas where we have water and volatile depositional areas. Um, and we've applied some machine learning and AI systems to provide predictions about where this would be. So as you can see along the flow path, that is the black line uh, in three dimensions. The most likely area we believe primarily for water to deposit are those two red blobs up there with the orange in between. You'll note there's a few other areas there as well, and those are most likely secondary targets or tertiary targets because uh, water and volatiles, like everything else, can be moved and remobilized by other forces, such as impacts um, from asteroids, landslides, slumps, and a number of other things that can occur. The thing is, is that when we take the 16 different uh, methodologies that my firm has developed for identifying this on a commercial basis for prospecting uh, and exploration and fuse it together, Using existing orbital data sets, uh, we can provide probabilistic resolutions much, much higher and stronger than we have with the current individual sensors that we have. Resolutions as low as 10 square kilometers per pixel. We can get that down to sub 100 meters square in terms of predictive. And that's what you need if you're going to do mission planning uh, and in order to really focus scarce and expensive exploration assets into those areas that you really, really care about. So putting it all together, these are the key takeaways that I'd like you to go with and understand. First of all, and this is a big one, the water and volatile deposits are most likely not going to be in the bottom of the PSR, the bottom of the crater, what I like to call the valley of death uh, for spacecraft. Instead, they're actually most likely on the crater walls within kilometers of the edge of this, so they are much more accessible for dashing in sampling, doing your work, and getting back out into lit regions where you can actually survive uh, with it. Um, and in addition, from a mining favorability perspective, you can dash in, grab impregnated regolith, bring it back out, and have your plant located in an area that is partially or fully lit, uh, which is much better operating conditions for your overall equipment. Uh, second of all, I've mentioned concentration of volatiles in certain zones, so you can specifically target both your exploration work and your mining activities into those specific zones so you can maximize the amount of the particular volatile species you're most interested in. In addition, um, another observation is that the areas that are most favorable for rover pathing and transversing the terrain also favor the deposition of the water and volatiles which means they're easier to get to in the areas where they likely will be. So that has some serious implications. And then finally, uh, even if you're not in the ISRU game, but are looking to do anything on the lunar surface, whether it's constructing landing pads, colonies, uh, communication systems, uh, all the rest of this, all of this is generally gonna revolve around where the resources are. Uh, all roads will sort of lead to this. So for, from a first principles perspective, you want to know where the volatile species are, where the resources are going to be, so that you can plan your missions in and around this, even though you're not directly involved in the ISRU game. And so with that, I'd like to close off my talk. We should make the organizers quite happy uh, and either open it up for questions or pass it on to the next speaker. Your call. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Jeff, and thank you. And thanking you uh, for bringing us back to some time where we can have a discussion afterwards. Uh, it's a really important topic, again, predicting the presence of water or where it's going to be, not just for an airless body like the moon, but I would assume like Ceres or Mercury, where the transport uh, processes in the atmosphere or the exosphere is very important to the deposition in the cold traps. So continuing with the theme of water, uh, I would like to invite the next speaker, who is Mayuko Shinohara uh, from the Shioda Corporation, who will be talking to us about lunar water analysis module with direct measurement. Please, thank you. Can you please remain on the stage for the finish? Okay. Good um, morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining my presentation, and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Mayuko Shinohara, and I'm from Chiyoda Corporation in Japan. Today, I'm going to introduce um, Lunar Water Analysis Module with a direct measurement. And we have been working this project with three companies, AS Chiyoda Corporation, iSpace, Yokogawa Electric, and also professors from Ibaraki University and Tokyo University. And in this presentation, I'm going to introduce what is our module and also what is our business scheme. So first of all, why are, you why are we going to the moon? I think people have a different motivation to go to the moon, but for us, we have two main reasons. One is for making an energy plant by using water on the moon for further space exploration and also for make a uh, lunar society. The second one is for uh, making a value chain between Earth, Moon, and the Cislunar Society. So the fourth, for the first reason, we believe that creating a liquid hydrogen and the oxygen on the Moon is essential for deep space exploration. And to do that, we need to have some kind of facility like an, like an energy plant. And those energy plant is also going to be helpful for making a moon society, like creating the infrastructure, um, making lifeline, and also for supporting human activity. And our company has been working uh, to make an energy plant by using LNG, oil, and gas on the earth, like you can see on the left-hand side of the slide. And this is our main business. But besides those business, we also been working with JAXA for about 20 years to make a, an experimental equipment for the ISS. So with those uh, experience, we believe that we can create an energy plant for space use by using water on the moon for, for the space exploration and also for making lunar society. And then for the second reason, we believe that um, we can bring the technology that is developed on the Earth to the moon, but also we can bring the technology that is developed on, for the moon and back to the Earth. So for example, there are people trying to grow vegetables on the moon, and it is essential for supporting human activities on the moon, but it is also for supporting people um, who is living in harsh environment in the, on the Earth. So creating a moon society is not only for deep space exploration, but it is also for us human beings on the Earth too. So our way to um, contribute to make those lun lunar society is to build an energy plant by using water on the moon. But to do that, we need to know how much resources we can use, what kind of resources, and also where are those resources at. This is why we started this project. And this is the uh, water analysis module that I want to present today. So this water analysis module can measure the concentration of water in a lunar regolith at a certain point and a certain depth in lunar surface. And this module consists with three major parts. One is the drill for the excavating the lunar regolith. Other one is the um, vaporizer which vaporizes the gas from the excavated regolith. And lastly, the laser ana um, gas analyzer, which is for the laser analysis to see the concentration of water in a lunar regolith. And the specification of this module is right-hand side of the slide. 
And the size of this mojo is gonna be 60 centimeter in the height and 30 by 30 for width and depth. The weight of this mojo is approximately 10 to 15 kilograms, but we are trying to make it as light as possible. And the drilling depth is gonna be 50 centimeter for the initial target, but we are trying to drill more than 50 centimeter after first emission it succeeded. And the measurable volatile is gonna be water, and it can measure from 0.1 weight percent to 10 weight percent. And for the first mission, we are trying to focus on uh, finding the water, but from second mission, we are trying to find other volatiles that is gonna be useful for both um, deep space exploration and also for creating moon society. And this is the basic uh, specification of this module. And the other specifications, such as mobility, electricity, and the communication method will be dependent on the carrier. So the first mission, we are trying to mount this module on the lander. But from second mission, we are trying to refine the design of this module and then mount it on the rover so that it's gonna have more mobility and it can move around from lunar polar to lunar equator. And this is one of the key elements of this module, which is tunable diode laser spectrometer, and we call it TDLS, and this is developed by Yokogawa Electric. And water analysis module adapts this TDLS, which is widely used on the Earth for in-light analysis for industrial process. And the reason why we adapt this TDLS is because we are trying to make this module as fast as we can. So we are trying to refine the design of this TDLS instead of creating the new technology from zero. And this TDLS can measure the um, optical absorption in near infrared region, and it calculates the specific gas concentration from the area or the peak of the spectrum curve. And there's almost no interference in transmitted light or other component, and it calculates precisely under even under tough condition. And we have tested to see this TDLS is compatible with other part of this module, and also to see the lower limit that this TDLS can measure. And this is the experiment we have done. So we put the TDLS and connect it to the vaporizer, which is developed by Chioda Corporation. And we connect this entire system to the vacuum um, vacuum pump so that we can simulate the vacuum condition uh, in the lunar surface. And we injected small amount of water into, into the vaporizer by using a syringe and heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius. And this is the result from TDLS. And as you can see on the left hand side of the slide, uh, TDLS reacts right after the water is injected into the vaporizer. And from this experiment, we confirmed that this TDLS can measure very small amount of water, such as 0.01 weight percent to 0.03 weight percent. Can I play this video somehow? Ah, uh, could you play this video? Ah, uh, okay. So this is the uh, demonstration module we created for the um, uh, rigorous sampling uh, developed by Chioda Corporation and Yokogawa Electric. So this demonstration module has um, also have three parts, the drill, vaporizer, and also downsized the version of TDLS. So this downsized the version of TDLS is mounted on this system, but the function of this TDLS is still under development. And this demonstration module is for functional and operational test. And with this demonstration module, we confirmed that this uh, simple configuration with cylindrical sleeve and the screw drill can execute the task to uh, acquire the targeting regwets from the lunar surface. And this is the um, downsized version of TDLS as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. And the one on the left-hand side is the, is the original version of TDLS. And it is pretty big and heavy, so Yokogawa Electric was trying to make it lighter and smaller. 
and the result is the one on the right hand side. And the one on the, the TGLS for space use is only weights about 3.1 kilograms, which, which is about one tenth of the original version of TGLS. So now they're trying to make it durable from the heat, cold, and also the radiation from radiation that this uh, module is gonna be experienced on the lunar surface. Now let me explain our business plan and also the timeline. So this is the timeline from developing the water analysis module to developing the um, energy plant by using water on the moon. So we started this project in 2021 and we finished uh, te fe um, technical feasibility test and also creating first demonstration module. And in this year, we are trying to uh, make the basic design and also start to do the BBM test. And we are targeting to launch our first module in 2026. And from 2027, we are trying to start to do the first commercial mission. And we are aiming to start to build our first um, energy plant from 2030. So between 2027 to 2030, we are trying to acquire the data related to water by using our module. Based on those data, we can determine how much resources we can use or how big or where should we build those energy plant. And our um, business plan between 2027 to 2030 is going to be selling those module and also selling those data that is acquired from our mission. And those data is gonna be like a, a water map of the moon and it is gonna be open to anyone from space agency, academics, and also for um, private companies. And this is our business plan. And this is the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for that interesting presentation. Uh, it's, it's an interplay between what you, resolution and miniaturization. How can you match the two things together? That's, I think, one of the holy grails of uh, ex uh, water exploration on the moon. And the final talk for this first session is uh, from the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology. It's Veneranda Lopez Diaz, who will be talking about heading towards a sustainable water management on Earth, the moon, and beyond. Please. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Veneranda from LIST, and I will talk about uh, one of the key space resources, water. Um, so uh, a better understanding of water cycle um, is essential for uh, a sustainable water exploitation and, um, and management. But very little is known about lunar water abundance, distribution, and um, form. And the distribution of water is very heterogeneous. Um, we see that uh, uh, less than the 3% of the total water on Earth uh, is uh, fresh water. And from this 3%, per, uh, 3% the 70% is trapped on the cryosphere. Uh, on, on the moon, uh, while the lunar poles could hold uh, hundreds of billions of kilograms of water ice, uh, the more equatorial uh, regions could be 100 times drier than uh, desertic zones on Earth. Um, the cryosphere-related uh, meltwater um, is uh, a key water resource to sustain population and economic activities uh, on arid and semi-arid uh, regions on Earth. And uh, on the moon, water is essential for the establishment of a uh, human and robotic um, uh, presence. So uh, what uh, oxygen and hydrogen isotopes uh, tell us um, is uh, they give us information about the water origin and about the distribution and redistribution mechanisms. And this uh, allows us to better understand the water cycle and is essential for uh, sustainable water management, uh, for a uh, better um, uh, understanding of the economic uh, profi profitability, whether the water deposit can be uh, considered as a reserves 
and uh, for um, a more appropriate uh, design of the detection, extraction, processing, beneficiation technologies, and also for better understanding the, the more complex extreme Earth environments. In this context, uh, sublimation is one uh, of the of the um, physical process that plays a major role in the water balance on Earth and Moon uh, cryosphere, and it will change the isotope signature, um, creating isotope fractionation, not only during the lunar um, water cycle, but also uh, during uh, lunar missions uh, sampling chain. Uh, so uh, we need to better understand the sublimation and related isotope fractionation uh, to uh, um, interpret correctly the, uh, the water cycle and also uh, the raw data coming from future lunar missions, uh, such a prospect uh, led by ESA, uh, targeting the analysis of the lunar surface and subsurface, and PATMS led by NASA, targeting the analysis of the lunar exosphere. And so the first thing that we can ask ourselves is whether we expect isotope fractionation in, in ice or it will just sublimate layer by layer. And the answer, the answer is yes, um, because um, the interface layer is a liquid-like layer and it will be becoming rich in uh, the uh, heavy water isotopologues and um, uh, sublimation it will create also vacancies in the uh, water ice lattice. And we can see that for temperatures lower than 200 kelvins, the diffusion uh, rate is higher than the sublimation rate because the, the heavy water uh, isotopologues it will diffuse downward the water ice lattice uh, downwards the concent concentration gradient. So um, up to now, there are only few uh, models for uh, the, the isotope fractionation factor and uh, they are built um, from the position data down to 233 kelvins. And when we uh, extrapolate it to lower temperatures, it returns in non coherent data, as we can see uh, with the dot and dash uh, green and, and black lines. And there are just few um, sublimation experimental data at low temperatures. Uh, represented with the markers, uh, cross and dot markers, and uh, it doesn't fit the existing uh, uh, sublimation uh, isotope fractionation models. So we have uh, built an uh, isotope fractionation model um, for an open system where we expect that all the sublimated water vapor is going to be evacuated, and so we consider humidity zero, and we consider uh, hexagonal ice structure and uh, a planar uh, specific surface area. And we relay on the hertz nudensen langimur equation because this, the, the um, determining step for sublimation is the, um, the desorption of the water molecules from the, from the surface. And we can see, if we see the, the violet line, is the um, kinetic isotope fractionation factor model. And we can see that it returns into current uh, uh, values, but it doesn't fit the, the, the experimental data. So uh, here, um, if we consider an open system where all the sublimated water is going to be evacuated, we can uh, assume that it, it will follow a Rayleigh-like uh, isotope fractionation. So um, we can represent the, the isotope uh, signature variation with the remaining ice uh, fraction at different temperatures. And we see that the solid line represents the lower temperature and at um, 168 kelvins, and uh, the isotope fractionation is more pronounced for lower temperatures. If we see uh, the data from uh, the experimental data from uh, Mortimer and Lequier, they found that there is no uh, relevant isotope fractionation uh, for a water ice mass loss lower than uh, 40 percent, um, but we find a relevant uh, Riley like fractionation for a water ice mass loss um, of 30 percent. And that if we uh, see at the lower temperature, it can go up to 117 per mil of enrichment. Why this difference? Can be uh, two reasons. Uh, one for the limitation in the experimental setup that Mortimer and Lequier used, that uh, probably the evacuation rate uh, was uh, lower than the sublimation rate, then uh, it, it will create equilibrium and it will not be the kinetic isotope fractionation, so the fractionation it will be lower. Or the introduction um, system that will uh, make that the, the initial water ice it will be like a, it will be a layer of uh, frost and not a volumetric ice, so it will not be diffusion. Or that the Rayleigh-like trend in solid it will be uh, less pronounced than in liquids. And so, which are the implications for the lunar uh, water? 
So we see here four graphs, and we see not only that the, the fractionation trend is more pronounced for the lower temperature, the black line represents 120 Kelvin, but also if we see in the, in the left, uh, we see that it's more pronounced for the higher concentration of the heavier isotopes. Uh, we can see in the left, in the up, minus uh, 800 per mil at 30% uh, uh, of water ice mass loss. We expect 34 per mil of enrichment, while a plus eight, uh, uh, initial isotope signature of plus eight, uh, 800 per mil, we expect 307 per mil. So, um, we can uh, suggest that uh, we, we will not find a, a relevant isotope uh, fractionation for a water ice mass loss lower than 10%. It will remain lower than 10 uh, per mil, which is okay because the, the variation in the, ice, the hydrogen isotope signature on the moon is quite large, spanning from uh, minus nine, almost minus 900 per mil if the water is created by solar wind implantation, passing by between minus 200 plus 200 per mil if it is uh, indigenous magmatic water up to uh, 30,000 per mil if it comes from interstellar ices. So uh, if um, for the uh, O18 isotope uh, fractionation factor, we have the same problem. Uh, there is just a few models uh, done uh, with um, experiments for deposition uh, uh, down to 233 Kelvin, and it doesn't extrapolate well uh, down to lower temperatures, but um, the ratio between the hydrogen and oxygen uh, ex isotope excess, uh, it follow a linear trend with the temperature, so we can use our hydrogen isotope fractionation uh, factor model, and um, the, the, the data from the the isotope fractionation, O18 isotope fractionation down to 233 Kelvin to uh, calculate this linear trend, use the slope and our model and calculate the O18 isotope fractionation model. And we see that for the uh, oxygen, the, the fractionation is lower uh, than uh, from, uh, for the uh, hydrogen as we can expect. So, but it is relevant because uh, on the moon, we expect an error a variation for O18 uh, isotope signature on the lunar rocks uh, that is lower than one per mil, uh, it, uh, similar to uh, Earth rocks. So a 30% of water ice mass loss having a 42 uh, per mil of enrichment is already a lot. So uh, to be below one per mil of enrichment, we should not lose uh, more than 0.1%. So if the water comes uh, from micrometeorite impacts or as asteroid impacts, it may have a different isotope signature different than lunar rocks, but I didn't find the data, so I could not compare. I can compare with the lighter isotope signature find on Earth, but it is very close to the lunar and Earth rocks, so uh, we return into the, uh, to the same conclusion. So um, we need experimental data to benchmark the isotope fractionation trend. And uh, we have developed uh, a sublimation uh, extraction prototype, uh, water ice sublimation and extraction prototype uh, to produce experimental data and see where this isotope fractionation will plot, if in non-relevant isotope fractionation like previous experimental data, or if an array like trend uh, like isotope fractionation as the model or somehow in the middle. And uh, what is special here is that the thermal management system doesn't rely in the, in the double wall uh, chamber filled with liquid nitrogen, so we don't have uh, colder uh, walls where the water will deposit once it is sublimated, so we, we will be able to collect it because the colder part is the thermal management system that is incorporated to the sublimating volume that is inside, and it will be the colder part. And also that the evacuation rate is always higher than the sublimation rate, so we are not creating equilibrium. Um, we, are, uh, uh, we will be able to study the, the kinetic isotope fractionation. So this is the sublimation chamber. They, it has a manipulation chamber by where uh, the sample is going to be introduced under a nitrogen atmosphere. And this is uh, the thermal management system has the DWAR where the, leak, the cryogenic fluid is, uh, is filled. And this is um, the cold finger that is in contact with the, with the cryogenic fluid, but also is separated from the sublimation volume because it contains the, the main heater. And this, uh, the, counter, the, the main counteracting heater is happening there. So uh, this is where there is the large uh, difference in temperature and is separated from the sublimation chamber by a thermal insulator. 
Then uh, in the sublimation chamber is entering a tubular shield uh, to which is attached a, a sample holder and it has an aperture by, by where and the, the water vapor is going to exit. And it has five PT100 uh, temperature sensors to control the, the gradient and also three different heating elements. Apart from the main element, uh, heating element, we have two heating foils to, to, to correct the, the temperature gradient. And this is the snapping system. Uh, we will uh, snap the, 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 um, the sample holder to the tubular shield and then retract the rod to avoid uh, heat transfer from the rod. And then and this is the sample holder uh, that it has uh, another PT100 and two thermocouples. And, uh, that, Probably I am running all the time. Yes, <laughs> and uh, this adapter to be able to put different uh, sample uh, sizes, uh, um, shielding element to avoid uh, the heating radiation um, from, from the, uh, this place in front of the aperture, and this copper with gold plate to avoid uh, water absorption. And if you want more information, you can find it in the patents that are already available in the database. And very fast, I will say, like, we prepare the sample and, and in liquid nitrogen, and we transport it in liquid nitrogen, introduce it under nitrogen atmosphere flashing at four bars to avoid the, the humidity entering in, uh, transfer it to the sublimation uh, volume. Uh, for the moment, we need to improve it, but it's not bad. Uh, it's, for the moment, we take a sample introduction for minutes, so we increase the temperature up to minus 100 degrees. Should be lower than uh, minus 140 degrees if we don't want to change the ice structure, but already we avoid uh, the loss of uh, water ice before starting the sublimation. Not bad. And then uh, we proceed with the step heating, sublimation at a stable temperature and pressure, and um, we collect the sample in this cold trap. It's an offline system and we, have, uh, we transfer it to a sample tube in vacuum, uh, to a vial with a, an hydrophobic tip, and we, we analyze it with the laser spectrometer. And then another feature like water traps, uh, automatic liquid nitrate uh, uh, refiller, and the software. And this is an example how the, uh, the sublimation temperature, the pressure uh, keep stable in the sublimation chamber. And we have a temperature uh, difference uh, within the sample um, volume less, uh, lower than three degrees. Um, these are a bit, the base pressure is 10 to the minus nine millibar, the, but the sublimation is carried, carried on at 10 to the minus seven millibar, minus 120 uh, degrees Celsius, because for the moment we are limited by the interface, by the collection system that could be improved, and we can go down to 10 to the minus 9 millibar. And now, I guess, uh, we are with the conclusions. And it's like um, sublimation is a key uh, physical process um, that uh, take part of the, of the cryosphere mass balance on Earth and on the Moon. And so, uh, and it will modify the isotope signature, so we need, we need to study it to, uh, to int uh, well interpret the, the water cycle, but also the raw data coming from future lunar missions. So what we find uh, in our theoretical model is that uh, we, expect a, a, we expect a relevant uh, Rayleigh-like uh, fractionation uh, for more than 10% uh, of water ice mass loss in the case of the hydrogen and more than 0.1% of water ice mass loss in the case of O18. And it doesn't fit the previous uh, experimental um, uh, data. Um, so a, an example uh, of the importance for the, for the lunar mission sampling chain is, for instance, for a specific surface area of 13, that is missing there, 13 square millimeters, we expect already uh, to lose uh, one milligram of water uh, in, in uh, 30 minutes at 190 kelvins. Uh, we represent already a 20% of uh, water ice mass loss. Um, so we need more experiments uh, to benchmark the isotope uh, fractionation trend. And uh, then the conclusion for our uh, sublimation extraction uh, prototype, uh, OK, is, you can read it, uh, sublimation and 10 to the minus uh, 7 millibar, 123 Kelvin, uh, temperature difference lower than 3 Kelvin and uh, we can study the kinetics in the... Thank you so much. Can you please join us? Yep, oh, here. Sorry, we're not trying to rush you. We're trying to ask you to speak so as ah, the crowd, okay. people can hear you at the back. Sorry about that. No, 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 it's okay. Please join us here. Just to be fair, uh, although we're running a bit uh, over time, uh, we have speakers from... Uh,
three different continents in the Northern Hemisphere, so I don't want to let them go without uh, having to ask them some questions. So if anybody has any questions to ask in this stage here, uh, in the crowd, please go to the microphone, which is in the center over there. Uh, otherwise, you can send them to us, and uh, uh, we'll make sure that they are asked. So thank you all for really an interesting uh, uh, session. Uh, you all worked on uh, either modeling or uh, sensing or analyzing water in the uh, environment of the moon or looking at the isotopes because that really is an essential uh, topic here because if we're making H2O and D2O and HDO, we need to make sure that what we're isolating for human consumption is different to other, so, uh, to other uh, utilization purposes. So, uh, one thing which really, uh, when I was uh, reading through your uh, uh, abstracts uh, the last couple of days and I started reading more into the topic itself, is the origin of water on the moon and the losses of water from the moon to the exosphere of the moon. And one thing which I found was uh, surprising is, well, not surprising to people who study the moon, is that the solar winds, which contain protons in them, they actually remove quite a lot of the hydroxyl species or the oxides in the regolith, not necessarily in the north and the south, but in the regolith itself. D do you have any idea what happens to that reaction between the protons and the OH, which occurs at the surface on the regolith, and removes the water from the surface. What happens to that? Because that is definitely a resource, because you remove H2O and you remove H2 as well, hydrogen. So if that can be removed by solar winds, is that something we should be looking at as a future uh, technology, as a future avenue to explore? Can I start with you first, perhaps? Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, so that's one of the um, kind of potential areas for useful water on the lunar surface. And um, from the kind of literature, what, what tends to happen to that water, um, so once the solar radiation comes in, it can release the OH, produce H2O. It can either have enough energy to just escape and disappear off into the atmosphere, or it can, I think you mentioned the ballistic hopping across the surface earlier on in your talk, so it can make its way to cold enough areas to then be trapped, maybe on the surface of grains, maybe underneath between grains. Um, so that is a potentially useful resource that um, could be replenishable, which is great in the context of sustainable exploration. Not in massive quantities, but you know, it's still useful. Um, so that is something that um, we could certainly be targeting if we're looking at areas other than just those PSRs in the polar regions as well. Jeff, if I may bring you on to this, because you also talked about the random walk, the drunken sailor model there, and uh, as a possible path for, do, do, do the, does this water actually migrate to the uh, cold traps in the uh, do we know if that, uh, that is the case, that they, where they get trapped or not? Well, there's almost certainly there will be some sort of losses associated with dissociation or having appropriate ballistic en energy to escape uh, the moon's gravitational forces and you know be lost into space with these things. Uh, the research that we've done actually shows, uh, once again, that the soil mechanics are very important because a lot of these things get trapped even millimeters and centimeters below the surface before it sublimates or before it uh, precipitates onto these ices. So the regolith grains itself on that desiccated layer at the, the top actually shield it, which probably inhibits a lot of the disassociation and losses that we uh, potentially are talking about because of the uh, ephemeral pore pressures and, and other shielding effects that occur by the actual microscopic structures of the soils on the moon, so that's, that's the geologist in me coming out to play on this one. So, yeah. But it has big effects because I've seen a lot of academic research where you're assuming sublimation rates on, in effect, a flat surface. And, yeah. and that does not exist yeah. in lunar regolith. So that, that's the short answer to keep it brief. So, yeah. Mayu, can I ask you, to, sorry, do you want to take that? Yeah. My, my, in terms of your, the instrumentations that you are developing, yeah? Yes. Are you looking at linking this to instrumentation to extract and utilize water, or are you just talking purely about 
detecting the isotopic signature between H2O, HDO, and D2O? Oh, could, you, could you say that again? I'm do, sorry? You, do you have any, any plans on uh, incorporating the uh, TDLS into extraction units, uh, extraction mo uh, modules, or are you talking to companies which will do that for you in the future? So, like, right now, like, we are trying to, like, like, like I said, like, there's, like, multiple companies, like, trying to um, extract the water and then making this module. And, um, <laughs> wait, I'm so sorry. Like, what, like, what was your, like, exactly you were asking? Yeah, I mean, are you working with people who are trying to produce water on the, uh, yeah. the moon? Yes. So that's what I'm saying. Will you incorporate your instrumentation onto water purification modules, water extraction? Yeah, extraction yeah, yeah. So right now, like, our company is, like, focusing on, like, the checking, like, what, like, how much resources right now. But there's, like, um, like a consortium in Japan, like, um, other companies, like, trying to, like, find a way to, like, actually make the liquid hydrogen and oxygen. So, like, there's, like, a lot of, like, Met, like there's like a lot of process, right? Like after you extract the water, like you need to purify it, you need to electri electrolyze it. So like, yeah, like of course we are talking to those people to like make it happen to make those energy plant by yeah. using water. Okay, thank you. And finally, coming coming to you, fractionation is really an interesting kinetic effect. Bacteria are fantastic at fractionating isotopes, he, even here down on Earth. So that's, that's one thing to be thinking about for the future. But one question which I have to you and for the rest, and I need a quick answer from all of you, which comes from uh, Tor Feigsen is, when will we get our first liter of drinking water on the moon for human consumption? When? When. When are humans going there? <laughs> no, uh, well, this is a good question. We can guess, but uh, we need to extract it, we need to collect it, we need to purify it, because we don't want to get poisoned. So there are a lot of technology that need to be developed, and uh, how many drops we collect at the end to make uh, the drinking water. Because then, um, yeah, we need to estimate the size of the, of the, of the deposit, and then uh, what we are going to do, we are going to extract water ice, we are going to extract uh, oxygen and uh, creating water, but we need to transport the hydrogen from Earth to reduce the oxygen, uh, the, the, the oxides, metal oxides, and produce water, or we are going to find another source of hydrogen on the moon. So, what Thank do you think? You. When? <laughs> Jeff, you're into the business, so what's your... Okay, you as a slight plug, I'm also the Chief Executive Officer of Interstellar Mining. I'm trying yeah. to get a water mine going on the yeah. moon. And I can tell you, um, you know, with the appropriate amount of funding uh, from the private sector, I can get an operating water mine that will produce a thousand metric tons of water within five years. That's more than a liter. Thank you all very much. Please join me in thanking our uh, speakers for the first session. Thank you so much. Take over. I have a question, if you don't I'm mind. <laughs> I know you're all experts, but I kind of, in this kind of like crossover between communication and science, I'm often asked by people, how technical should their talks be? And, and I wondered, this is your field, and this is your field. Did you understand each other's talks? Yeah. You, you did, okay. Okay, so we're, we're all scientists, so... No, 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 I, I, I get that. I'm just wondering sometimes, because people, scientists ask me sometimes, how technical should their talks be? And so, hands up here. I love you, Veneranda. I know you, and we've worked together. Your talk, I think, was very technical. Hands up who understood Veneranda's talk. That's good enough for me. That's good. That's yeah. good. That's good. Congratulations. I know the work is hard. I stopped breathing through the entire talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you very much. And now you may get off the stage unless you want to stay here, but uh, make space with others. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry about that. I attract your attention to the.
Okay. Um, we're shifting a bit uh, in terms of uh, emphasis, except for the, the first talk, which is still also regarding uh, water. And it is from Isric here in Luxembourg. And it is presented by Alberto Maulu about multi-attribute decision-making, or MADM, method for the evaluation of ISRU enabling technologies. And there's some interesting stuff which will be discussed in here. Please. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming here to Luxembourg. And thanks to all the colleagues for uh, the really insightful uh, presentation. Indeed, uh, we need to have uh, these ambitious plans uh, and activities uh, to enable RSIU unprecedented objectives. We are not just going to space to do something we never did before, but we are planning to do it in a uh, scalable, uh, sustained and sustainable way. And uh, we need these activities and these plans. But the big challenge here is uh, to make long-term strategies with the limited information we have on the lunar environment, the related operation, and the limited information we have on this technology that are still untested. And here at Estric, uh, we think that a multi-criteria decision-making method uh, can uh, bring the necessary support for addressing this strategic uh, challenge. Let me use an example to better, uh, to better show what I mean. Imagine your company is taking part of a mission to go to the moon and test some uh, technology. And you are in charge of developing uh, the technology for extracting oxygen from the moon. So what do you do? You start um, making, a, uh, making an analysis of what are the available technology to do the job. And then, based on payload requirement, uh, you uh, define a set of criteria to evaluate these technologies. And uh, soon you realize that each technology has pros and cons. But how to, how to weigh this? How to understand what are the pros, the cons, and uh, understand how to work to improve them or uh, to identify what is the right one to do the job? This task is not easy. Uh, the criteria uh, are often uh, conflicting. Almost all the time they are interrelated. So you touch one criteria and you influence all the group of criteria, and still you have to do that using the limited information you have, both on technology and on the lunar environment. So MCDM, multi-criteria decision-making, uh, it can support uh, this task by end all the complexity and uncertainty of, uh, of the RSIU. And uh, here we develop a method dedicated to this uh, to these um, conditions, let's say. And here I will bring you some of the basic step of the method. On the top left, we can see that uh, we use a fuzzy set to evaluate the criteria, where we use, um, we propose to use to the expert uh, um, simple linguistic terms, such as very low, low, high, very high, to uh, give their judgments. Uh, those Linguistic terms are associated to a mathematical construct that represent the uncertainty. But the judgment is made through the cognitive mapping that is really intuitive, where in the square, uh, the expert can evaluate the priority of one criterion uh, in uh, comparison to the other criterion. And uh, as you see with the arrow, is evaluated the influence of one criterion on the other. This is made for each criterion uh, with respect to every other criterion. The results then are organized into a complex matrix. I will not uh, uh, show it here. Then they go through the algorithm. And as a result, we have a weighted criteria. So we have some numbers. They give you the importance of each criteria. Those criteria then are used to uh, uh, evaluate the performance of uh, the alternative technologies. Um, and here we can see that uh, molten salt electrolysis, for example, is uh, the best technology to uh, do the job, to extract 100 gram of oxygen in uh, one lunar daylight in a mission that is expected to, be, to take place quite soon. These results, obviously, are uh, uh, just uh, to showcase uh, the, um, uh, 
the performance and the potential of these methods. But in reality, a multi-criteria decision-making method is a systematic, iterative, is a collaborative approach where a multidisciplinary group of experts are called to give their input. And as a result, the method gives some recommendation from a basic identification of uh, the most uh, um, the most promising technology to a ranking, sorting, choice, or more insightful information about the decision problem. So how much uh, the uncertainty can influence the results, how much the judgment of the expert is, um, is, is shared, how much they agree on what they, what they judge, and uh, how much, for example, the changing uh, priority of a criteria can result in a changing of results. So it's not just a method to uh, take all um, um, identified uh, dilemmas, but it's a method that can be used to monitor uh, and manage um, development uh, of activities and evolving scenarios. This method, this method is not obviously trivial, and is, it, it can take time to be implemented, but it's uh, really, really um, important to do it to the risk activities, and indeed it's been used for uh, decades now in, uh, in complex and high-risk decision-making in fields such as mining, healthcare, crisis management. It's been used a lot with the, uh, with the recent year and with all the crises that we, I've been facing. So uh, I'm, I'm here hoping that I give you a hint of the potential of uh, MCDM for the ISRU um, in, in um, uh, framing this complex scenario and providing uh, data-driven, uh, rational, quantitative information to support decision making in enabling uh, the future of space exploration. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto, and thank you for highlighting the importance of interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, particularly when dealing with resources on the moon, and that's extremely important. And to highlight this are the next three speakers. The first one is Stefan Linker from TU Berlin and the Lazat Centrum in Hanover. He'll be talking to us about the recent advances of the Moonrise FM payload for the demonstration of regolith laser melting on the surface. Please, welcome Stefan. Yeah, thanks for the introduction and good morning, everybody. Um, yes, uh, I want to give you um, an overview of the progress of the development of the Moonrise payload uh, for the demonstration of regular laser melting directly on the lunar surface. Um, the technology approach is uh, that we use a laser for melting and sintering the lunar regolith directly on site, which has the advantages of uh, it needs no additional binders and consumers. Uh, we also need no uh, pre-processing of the lunar regolith. We can directly work on the lunar surface. Um, the technology can be made mobile. It is independent from direct sunlight. And um, we have, have a good manufacturing uh, precision and this process is scalable uh, and highly automatable, uh, which is good for one of the main um, purposes of de-dusting large areas on the lunar surface and support of lunar infrastructures. Um, as we developed this technology for several years, we are now at the point where we start uh, development of the flight hardware of the experiment, and we plan to deliver it with the commercial lander to the lunar surface. Um, deploy it via a robotic um, arm or a rover, and then start sintering tests on the, on the surface, at least uh, laser beads, but hopefully two-dimensional objects on the lunar surface. Afterwards, we will make an evaluation of the melting results with a camera-based artificial intelligence. So to give you an overview of what uh, the uh, payload looks like, here you see a picture of the actual uh, development status. Um, the payload itself is quite small and lightweight. We are uh, focused on uh, minimizing the weight and uh, the complexity of the system. Um, we have a mass of, at the moment, 2.5 kilogram, but we will be below 2 kilogram for the flight hardware. 
Um, the dimensions are 1.5 U, so cubesat cube size, um, 50 centimeter to 10 centimeter to 10 centimeter. Uh, and for the laser, uh, we have an uh, optical output power of 6 to 140 watts, so a broad range of uh, processing parameters we can just adjust by the energy input. And the overall power consumption of this module is uh, 25 watts to uh, 340 watts. Um, one activity of the last year was uh, to see um, if a Galvano scanner for the laser beam direction uh, is um, a possible technology to produce two uh, dimensional areas uh, on the lunar surface for the laser melting without any other moving parts. And uh, therefore we make uh, tests with several different uh, types of um, lunar um, regolith simulants we produced on our own with our regolith system. Um, and uh, to manufacture samples in a vacuum chamber. Um, we tested different uh, processes with unidirectional uh, laser beam uh, or contour filling paths, um, produced two dimensional structures of the size of 20 by 20 millimeter, and also we tested the stitching of these samples to bigger areas um, to make sure that we are able to produce stable and crack free materials from different types of, uh, of, of uh, regular types, uh, which we expect to find on the landing sites of the uh, future missions. We use for that the original uh, laser system, which we also plan to fly to the lunar surface. You see some samples on the right side. These are the stitched samples of uh, 40 to 40 millimeter. Um, what uh, also we find out is uh, we make an um, evaluation of the material properties. Um, we see that depending on the uh, melting rate of the, uh, of the regolith, we can uh, produce material ranging from a yeah, sandstone-like uh, type up to concrete or ceramic-like materials. And if we have 100% melting rate, we can produce glass with this laser system just by adding, uh, uh, process or, or changing the process parameters. Um, what we also see is when we work in vacuum, we have uh, materials with a high porosity, up to 60%. Um, depending on the uh, viscosity of the melt, which depends on the type of uh, regulate uh, simulant or the regulate itself, uh, we have a high amount of, of small pores, or if the viscosity is lower, a uh, few, um, few pores of a higher um, um, diameter. We also make some uh, mechanical tests, for example, uh, tensile strength tests, and uh, with uh, these we found that we have um, in the samples um, tensile strength up to 12 uh, newton per square centimeter, which is typical for these materials. Um, finally, uh, we can say uh, that um, the um, Technology seems to be ready for use everywhere on the moon. So we are free to choose uh, the uh, lander, landing mission. We can land everywhere on the moon and make the, the, um, the experiments. And then we uh, also will be able to use or can process all the materials we will found. That's a good uh, news. And so we are at the moment it's, uh, looking for a mission which brings us to the moon. Hopefully, by the end of the year, we will make progress on that. Yeah, finally, I want to thank uh, our uh, sponsors, ESA and DLR, in the name of the whole team. And as we get a lot of questions about the availability of our uh, lunar regolith simulants, I have here a contact address of my colleague, Johannes Becker. If you are interested in uh, purchasing some of these simulants, please contact him or me in the, uh, afterwards uh, to this uh, session. I'm here until end of the, of, the, um, of the Space Resource Week. Yeah, and that's it from my side. I hopefully I was uh, in time. Thanks for listening, and if you have some questions, please feel free. Thanks. In time. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. That's uh, really uh, impressive, and the importance of uh, regolith is the topic also of the next two lectures. And uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Beth Lomax from ESA. She, if you, some of you who were here last year remember, remember she gave a talk about the uh, uh, use of molten salt electrochemistry, and she gave a very impressive, uh, impressive presentation on electrochemistry under gravi uh, low gravity. And uh, I look forward to listening to what she has to talk to, about, to us today about uh, sintering regolith pellets for FFC molten salt processing. FFC, for those who don't know what that is, that's a method developed by... Uh, Frey, Farthing, and Chen in the 1995-96. So I'd like to welcome Beth. Please join me in welcoming her on the stage. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so today I just wanted to share with you some preliminary results from an ongoing research project where we're sintering for Apollo samples for use in uh, molten salt electrolysis experiments. And I just want to sh thank uh, Gabon Champeter. He uh, did a lot of the procedural development work during his internship at STEC last year. Uh, so the research context, uh, as was nicely introduced already, is uh, we work with molten salt electrolysis to extract oxygen and metals from, from the lunar regolith. And the regolith goes in as a solid at the cathode. And of course, all of the work that we do in the lab primarily deals with uh, the lunar regolith simulants. And so this led to the question of uh, you know, how would the real material behave relative to what we see with the, the simulant material. So we applied for uh, four Apollo samples and we're lucky enough to be uh, allocated them. We have uh, two Mare samples and two Highland samples and also two mature samples and two immature samples. And I'll explain what that term means in the next slide. Um, this of course, uh, in the Apollo sample world, one gram per sample is uh, very generous. But uh, for what we do, that's very, very small compared to what we normally work with. So this then required the miniaturization of our experiment. Um, and we really didn't want to lose the material in the salt uh, before the experiment could be done, so that meant that we had to uh, sinter it first to be able to contain it properly in such a small quantity. And that led to uh, us being able to then investigate a secondary research question with the same samples, which is what impact do these different material properties in these samples have on the, the sintering behavior? And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, so quickly, what is sintering? Uh, sintering is forming a solid mass from a powdered material using uh, heat and or pressure. So essentially we're trying to glue the material together to form a coherent block, but without it being fully molten. And why is it useful to understand or predict this behavior uh, for pre-processing and simplified handling, as in this case where we want to pre-sinter it? Uh, Pre-sintering is also used for manu manufacturing or construction processes. Also, we might just want to understand how to avoid sintering uh, if we don't want to clog something like a fluidized bed reactor, for example. And we might have limited information available on the, the material properties that we're working with. So being able to how, to how to relate these properties to sintering behavior is important. Uh, so just quickly, what is soil maturity? Uh, the soil, lunar soil maturity is just a description of the degree of surface exposure. So longer surface exposure means that it's had more space weathering. And in this context, the, the most important space weathering process is more bombardment from micrometeoroids. So the mature material has a lower average particle size uh, more glassy agglutinates, and also more nanophased iron and these glassy rims that can be found on the surface of the particles. So that's represented by the term IS slash FEO. Um, and of course, we, we know a lot about sintering, but uh, a lot of these properties of regolith are, are quite unique to regolith, so it's important to try and uh, understand how the regolith behaves uh, relative to what we might expect from what we know about sintering already. Uh, so quickly touching on the procedure, there was a list of priorities that defined our procedure. The first one being, don't lose the sample. <laughs> and that meant that we really wanted to avoid melting the, the material to the oxide crucible, because once it's melted, it's fused forever. Um, so this meant that we did a very slow, stepwise sintering using a normal furnace. Uh, and after every heating cycle, we held for one hour. We then analyzed the material and decided how much to increase by. Uh, so it's a slow process, and we started at a safe temperature. The second priority was don't lose the sample. And uh, in this case, it was we really wanted to avoid particle loss into the salt uh, in the next stage of the experiment. And so for that reason, uh, you can see the two examples there of XCT images of sintered pellets. These actually look very similar on the outside, but you can see they're structurally quite different. Um, and the, the one on the left there, there's a lot of particles loose on the surface still, and it's very loosely sintered together. And so as we introduce that to the salt, it would likely crumble apart and we would have more particle loss. So we were aiming for a very well sintered material. Uh, and then the third priority, uh, we, we were wanting the best properties for FFC molten salt reduction. And so uh, we want to maximize the, the porosity and maximize open porosity. And so we don't apply any pressure to the material. So these materials would be terrible in construction. They have bad mechanical properties. We're aiming for porosity. Um, and then we want to avoid over sintering to, so we don't want a glassy material with uh, lots of closed pores. So to look at what these uh, materials look like throughout processing, uh, the, the picture on the left there shows uh, the powder before any processing. I quite like this picture because it just shows uh, how cohesive the material is at almost a further than horizontal angle. It still holds its shape. Um, then the, the second picture there shows the, the color difference between Apollo 11 and Apollo 16 material. 
And uh, these are the four pellets we've made so far. So we're going to make eight in total, and we're halfway through at the moment. Um, these are, as you can see, they actually look quite similar on the outside from the, the three different landing sites, uh, but they've got quite different properties. And that's just uh, showing exactly where one of those pellets uh, came from on the lunar surface. So to go on to the, the results, um, we wanted to first look at uh, what we might predict uh, in terms of melting behavior based on the composition and comparing the, the materials to one another. Uh, so we looked at the uh, weighted average oxide melting point um, because the, the oxide content is probably one of the first uh, things we might know about a material at a given landing site. Of course, the, the material is not made up of pure oxides, but we can say in general that if there's, a high, if there's a high quantity of a high melting point oxide, for example, calcium oxide, in a given mineral, that will raise the melting point of that mineral relative to, to if it's got low melting point oxides in it, for example, sodium oxide and plagioclase. So based on composition alone, we might expect that the temperature, the sintering temperature of the highland material would be 80 to 100 degrees higher than Mare. Uh, we also might expect that the Apollo 11 sample would center at a slightly higher temperature than Apollo 15, and the Apollo 16s should be relatively similar because they came from the same landing site. Uh, so this graph just shows the, the final sintering temperature in red, and then also the, the first shrinkage temperature in blue. So that's where the material first uh, shrunk away from the walls, and it was removable as a poorly sintered pallet. And so as we can see here, uh, the composition pretty uh, reasonably predicts the difference between Mari and Highland material. That on average, the, the Highland material did center at a higher temperature than the Mari material. However, the other two uh, predictions that we could make based on composition don't hold up at all. So the, the Apollo 11, as it would be predicted to be slightly higher based on the composition, actually centered at quite a lower temperature. By the time that it was very well centered, the Apollo 15 sample wasn't even shrunken away from the walls or removable from the crucible. So to look at the the difference that we see relative to what the composition would predict, predict, we can look at this as a ratio. And here we can really see that the, the immature material centers at a higher temperature than the mature material. And the other thing that we can see is that the, the speed of the sintering, so how rapidly it goes from being lightly sintered to very sintered, um, is quite different for the materials as well. So some preliminary conclusions based on this first data set is um, Mare regolith centers at a lower temperature uh, than Highland regolith. The, the mature regolith will have a lower sintering temperature relative to immature regolith of a similar composition. Mare regolith will center faster than Highland's regolith, and mature regolith will center slower relative to immature regolith. So now to just hone in on uh, the, the difference we see based on maturity. As I mentioned, maturity as a term represents a number of uh, properties. And while some of these samples are de uh, designated mature or immature, they have a different uh, properties. And so we can look at that. Um, so here is that data represented against average particle size in microns and against the glutinate content. And we can see that the, um, like both of these things correlate quite well with the final sintering temperature ratio uh, to what we would predict from the composition. And so here we might be able to say that uh, we could predict the final sintering temperature based on a combination of these factors, so composition and uh, particle size and or agglutinates. It's not surprising that both of these things correlate because they correlate to each other, uh, the, the average particle, average particle size size and the agglutinate content, and so work is ongoing at the moment to use some uh, specific tests with some mounts to really tease out the difference between those, those things, so uh, we don't have that to present just yet. Um, but we do see a poor correlation with the sintering onset, so the, the beginning of that sintering stage. And then if we look at the, the data against the, the IS slash FEO, so that's the, the uh, proportion of the iron that's in the nanophase iron state and also the, uh, the proportion of those glassy rims and the, um, the amount of the glassy rims on the particles. We see that this actually correlates better to the first, uh, first sintering onset, but not as well to the final sintering temperature. And so the, our current hypothesis is that maybe the, the, the glassy rims on the, the surface of the particles is actually uh, gluing the material together kind of prematurely, but it doesn't actually impact the overall phase change behavior. So it doesn't impact the final sintering temperature, but just does that initial gluing. Uh, so to look at the uh, monitoring the porosity throughout the sintering process, um, so we're using XCT primarily. Um, you can see there the, the, the difference in the material structure of one of the Apollo 16 samples going from uh, 1205 to 1230. And we can monitor their porosity as it changes throughout and the open and closed porosity. Um, it's quite hard to compare the materials to each other because as I showed in the last slide, they have very different uh, average particle size. 
Um, and so the, the porosity is not directly comparable. So using this first data set, uh, I wanted to look for a way to um, look at how sintered the material is in a more comparable way. And so to do this, I took uh, 50 slices throughout the XCT 3D image, and from the binary image, uh, calculated the, the, the amount of the, the ratio of the largest particle area to the total particle area size. So it's essentially just a metric of uh, particle connectivity. So in the final one there, we can see that uh, the largest particle, or 97% of the particles are actually connected together. And this is a bit more of a comparable way between, uh, to compare materials of very different porosities. So we can apply that to the next data set as well. And then to look at the, the material compared to each other in terms of the final uh, pallet porosity and uh, structure, and you can see here that the, the top two examples, the two immature ones that have the, the higher average particle size, have a, a quite different structure, much more uh, open structure and la much larger pores. And this is reflected in the data that we can see where the, um, the, the shrinkage is correlated to the average particle size and also the total porosity. And so overall, uh, we, we find that the mature material has a much more closed and dense structure, uh, more shrinkage, lower porosity, more closed pores. And the porosity and shrinkage can be correlated to that particle size. Um, I think that the structure will likely have a really large impact on the molten salt reduction process that will be carried out in the next stage of this, uh, this experimental work. So that'll be really interesting to see as well. And here, I just wanted to show this video, uh, not because it's related, but it's just cool. Um, it's a XCT fly-through uh, from one of the samples, the Apollo 16 samples, where we found a spherical glass, hollow glass bead in the sample that was probably formed from an impact event. And it's got uh, other powder kind of contained within it. Yeah, so it's just cool. Um, so then uh, to conclude the work and talk about the, the future work, um, the prelimin preliminary results show that the soil maturity impacts the sintering behavior. And the sintering behavior is can likely be linked to both the chemical composition and these physical properties. Um, a combination of these properties could be used to predict the sintering behavior of material in situ based on quite a small data set of information about the material. And uh, there's large variation in the sintered pallet structure and porosity. And so then for the ongoing work, uh, of course, we want to sinter the second set of samples using any lessons learned from the first data set and compare the behavior to the first data set. Uh, and also we want to examine the impact of particle size versus glass content using simulants and really uh, tease those two things out. Uh, and finally, of course, complete the second part of the study, which is to extract oxygen and metal from, from these pellets. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for the uh, update on your research. And to continue with the same theme, I'm delighted to welcome John from Blackface from Thales, who will be talking about using these or using something similar in terms of the uh, FCC process to produce oxygen and to produce uh, the metals themselves and how to incorporate these into one of those things over there. Please join me on stage. Thank you. Oh, yeah, so Beth, did you say Apollo samples? <laughs> I'll be writing an email to Ryan Ziegler this afternoon. Yes, yeah. Um, so, going on, I, I'm John Fableskis from Tala's Lina Space. Um, I'm working on the ISRU demonstration mission. David Binns mentioned it on earlier yesterday um, about a mission, a demonstration mission, to demonstrate that extracting oxygen from regolith using the FFC process is possible on the surface of the moon. Uh, now, how do we know it's possible from the surface of the moon is a big question, not just a science question, uh, but it's a commercial question now as well. Uh, and so, in, in terms of framing the discussion, um, what we're interested at Tyler Zellini Space and the team we have there as well, Added Valley Solutions UK, um, Metallicis as well, who own, who own the rights to the FFC process now, and Redwire and the Open University, is we're looking to do a demonstration mission that can be put on the surface of the moon to show that the process works. And coming back to Beth's presentation last year, bubbles, you know, bubbles are, are, are a nightmare beyond belief. Um, so what we do, um, breadboards, um, breadboards and testing. 
So coming back to what, to what Lisa said earlier on about the pitch in the right level, one of the things about Space Resources Week, it's such a fantastic mix of lots of different communities uh, and lots of different approaches, lots of different ideas, and there's always something interesting. Uh, and it's difficult to mix the commercial side of things, venture cap, I'm sure there's venture capitalists in this room at the moment, keep it very quiet. Um, uh, the scientists, the geopolitical, the socioeconomic, uh, and it's difficult to pitch, a, pitch a, uh, to the right level, and I hope I've got the right level today. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is breadboard testing, really, and what the, 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 the breadboard testing is all about, and what we, we, we've been doing in Tyler's Lean Space in Bristol, is demonstrating technology works in a relevant environment. So I always relate that to a sports car. A sports car on the test track will go 300 kilometers an hour. Fine, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. But then if you're on a rainy day in the center of London, it's not going 200 kilometers, 300 kilometers an hour, it's going much, much slower. And so what you've got to do is look at all this engineering, and I'm an engineer, and put it in its uh, context and see how it works in a relevant environment. And the moon as a relevant environment is a, a very, very difficult place to operate. So um, what, we, what I'm doing here is uh, presenting our, our experience on breadboards and giving you some general overviews. A lot of the details are, are commercial, so I can't say too much about the details. But uh, breadboards are, uh, are interesting and are very different to prototypes. And you, you do need to um, be very uh, creative in how you do the breadboard because you need to, to put the breadboard in that relevant environment. You need to put that sports car in a London rainy street. So this is one of the uh, dullest slides I've ever presented, but it's one of the most important. It's about the TRL level. Again, pitching it right. Have I got the right pitch to the right level of understanding? Technology readiness levels are very important, not just for the, for the engineering, for the science, but also for the commercial side of things. That what we're trying to do with the ISRU demonstration mission is to, before we, we start to build it, we need to demonstrate that the technology has this technology readiness level of five. The component, component and or breadboard critical function verification in a relevant environment. So, one of the reasons why this is so dull is that the technology readiness levels have changed over the last 10, 15 years, and, and there, there is a new ISO 16290 standard. But that TRL level five, halfway down on the right-hand side, component and or breadboard critical function verification in a relevant environment are, are very, very important words. So jumping back out again, Breadboard, um, if people aren't aware of where the word breadboard came from, I, I've taken this off, off Wikipedia. It, it, it's something for, for, for what we do in Tyler's Lean Space in, in, in Bristol is electronic design. So before digital uh, simulations of electronic circuits, the, the way to, 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 to test a, a circuit was to, to generally sort of put a printout of your, your circuit onto a, onto a piece of wood, uh, stick it onto a piece of wood, and then put nails in and join wires up and put components on. That's where the breadboard comes from. Um, as I said, digital modeling has replaced the basic circuits. But um, for us, in it, what we do, with our, because we're primarily interested in electronic circuits, we then sometimes have to put those electronic circuits outside their test track and in the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the London rainy streets to put them in into a relevant environment because there are things that we just can't do a simulation of or, or model uh, because it's something that we've never really had any experience of before. So here's a very early breadboard example and it's very similar to the presentation earlier on this morning uh, that we did. It's just circuit boards that we, 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 look, we, we look at, and um, the, we, we then have to link the, the electronic circuits, which is it's a very pure and deterministic behavior, into something that isn't, doesn't have a pure and deterministic behavior, a thermal environment with, with aging processes and, and with, with um, variable um, 
variable light conditions. So this is a, a very simple breadboard going into a, uh, uh, an LED, and we need to operate the LED in a, in a test chamber at different temperatures, and that test chamber is the relevant environment. And um, we can't, generally you can't model these things, and if we could model them, um, uh, we wouldn't need to be doing the testing, really. So this is a more interesting uh, breadboard as well. And um, this is a Stirling engine that we developed with STFC RAL uh, about 10 years ago. And it's had, its, had its, uh, some really tough, tough, tough testing. So we, 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 we were involved because we did the electronics on the bottom left-hand corner. But STFC RAL and Centre Spatial Liège were involved because they had to demonstrate that a radioisotope could be heated to about 800 centigrade in a vacuum. And that radioisotope heat could be drawn into the uh, Stirling engine. And that Stirling engine could convert the heat into a mechanical energy that could then be converted into an electrical, uh, an alternating current electrical energy, energy, which we could then convert into a, a DC spacecraft conditioned 24 volts. And that, that link of heat energy going to mechanical energy, going to AC energy, going to um, DC energy, that, that heat flow just couldn't be modelled. It's such a complex situation, and, and there's so many feedbacks that could happen in unusual ways that we just weren't able to, to, to do it just by purely uh, simulation. So we built a breadboard, we put it in a vacuum chamber, heated it to 800 centigrade. What could go wrong? Of, of course, loads. And I can't, I can't go through all the details, but you have to, and, and I say something that the technologies that have been presented here, to, here this week will have to go through at some point to demonstrate that they can be used on the surface of the moon reliably. So uh, metallysis, the, the critical functions. So coming back to the TRL5, critical functions in a relevant environment. And these are, if, if you are looking at any electrolysis process, um, this, the, these are some of the critical functions that you need to be aware of um, before, you, um, uh, before you design your testing, basically. That there's lots of unanswered questions, and, and Beth was the source of a lot of these questions, and bubbles are down there as well. Uh, salt circulation and bubbles, number two. Um, but um, a lot of the questions were asked were because we just don't know how things will behave on, on the moon. Um, and coming back to the next slide, the, the relevant environment on the moon. Um, the, the, the relevant environment, and there's one I've missed off this list, uh, in fact, although um, I'll come to it at the end. You have that regolith cohesiveness, that regolith stickiness. So, for example, David Binns, when, when we first talked, David Binns from Easter, when we first talked, said that when you push regolith, Apollo regolith, it's like pushing toothpaste more, like, more than pushing that sand. And Joe Luca, a PhD uh, that uh, Tyler's Lena Space wants, has got a poster on the outside talking about seeing if you can actually do some modeling to, 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 to um, simulate that, that stickiness. And so if you are doing any sort of pre-processing of, of any, any, any regular sample from the, from the moon surface, you, you, you could have some very difficult problems handling it. Then there's one-sixth gravity as well. Again, Beth's experiment. Uh, um, how to do, how, will, it, will, will the electrolysis work in one-sixth gravity? Um, and that's, that's really is the most important, the most difficult one to, to, to sort of, to replicate on Earth because of its, um, unless you do a, a, a microgravity flight and then set up your own, set up your own um, um, rotation, on, 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 the, on the flight, you're never going to achieve it. Another option is maybe do a zero G flight, although you don't do a zero G, you do a one six G flight. But then who's going to take a vacuum chamber with a, with a, um, a tub of molten, molten salt in, inside onto, onto an aircraft? Then there's a vacuum of the moon. We, we touched on it already. 
um, on some of the LSIC um, discussions, some of the Apollo experience was coming out, and, and the, 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 there is speculation without any, any evidence that I've seen that perhaps the, the, the really, really hard vacuum that you've got on the moon uh, and the behavior of some of these particles in, 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 that, in that really, really hard vacuum may not be properly um, replicated on Earth as well. Um, they, they, they had some examples from, I think it was the Apollo 17 rover, and because the fender was broken on the Apollo 17 rover, it threw up loads and loads of regolith behind it, and, and seeing the old, old film of, of those, those trips, you can see how, 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 how oddly uh, regolith behaves. Then there's the high temperature salt and gases in a vacuum, which is uh, something that we're not so used to um, in, in the space industry. We're used with our electronic circuits to having everything really, really clean, really, 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 really nice and shiny. And then you, you go back and you see the, 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 the crucibles after high temperature testing and, and salt and, and uh, deformations, corrosion, uh, the lots and lots of problems. Um, and uh, how to deal with those is, 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 is a, yeah, it's a design, but y you're never sure. Uh, lunar surface temperatures is, is another one. Radiation. The vibration um, is not from the moon, but it's from the, the launch to the moon. Um, that some of the materials that we would like to do for some of the high temperature uh, applications may not have been flown in space before, and, and we have to do some qualification uh, uh, and some, some materials testing to make sure that they are suitable for, for space flight. And the final, the final one, or oh, sorry, second to last one, the one I've missed off the list is electrostat electrostatic. Uh, electrostatic is another one that's very, very difficult to, to replicate on, on, on Earth, and how do we replicate that during the, the breadboard testing is, is something that um, may not be possible, but... I say that's why Space Resources Week is so, so good that you do see lots of different approaches, lots of different ways, and, and, and lots of different analysis that may help you demonstrate that the technology will work on, on, on the surface of the moon. The last one, the unknown unknowns. The, the whole point of, of putting the, 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 the engineering into a relevant environment is to find out what you don't know. Uh, and different to qualification testing, Breadboard testing, uh, if you do get an unexpected result, is a success. Because um, if you do breadboard testing and everything goes as you expected, then, well, you're not kind of learning anything. But uh, it's the unexpected results that you learn the most from during breadboard testing. And the unexpected results are, are something that you just cannot foresee, but are, are very useful for no, to know for the, uh, for the final prototype build and flight model build. Finally, TRL Valley of Death. Coming back to the TRLs again. Um, you see the work that, again, Beth does, and her colleagues as well, in, in Esric and, and, and Mel as well, um, um, in, in academia, in research groups, and how to get all these great ideas, and we've seen lots of great ideas this week, into industry. And there's a gap, generally. And uh, it was the hockey stick that's mentioned on day one, in fact, as well, that there's, there, there is a gap of how to get these great ideas into a product. And between 4, 5, and 6, TRL 4, 5, and 6, uh, it's called the valley of death because technology fails, not because of an inherent problem with the, the engineering or the science, but it's generally non-technical problems. So I've listed some of those non-technical non problems there. Um, and uh, it, yeah, it's, it's frustrating as hell. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of startups here who are sort of just approaching that gap. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's something to recognize and, and something to realize that the problems you're facing are not technological, but they are non-technological and that may help you to solve them. So we've got Joe and Max at the... Um, Space Resources Week uh, here today, and uh, yeah, if you do want any more, ask, have any more questions, do come and ask us. Thank okay, so thanks so much.
Thank you so much, John. Thank you all to the speakers. We have five minutes of uh, uh, questions and answers. We have plenty of questions coming in. We will not be able to answer all of them. Uh, well, one question which I have for the three of you there first is it's very interesting, but and uh, you know you highlight the challenges which are there. That's why I called it the mother of all the holy grails. What we're talking about power sources. How are you going to? I mean, these methods you're talking about they consume large amounts of power. So how do you foresee overcoming these problems? Uh, you know, molten salt electrolysis, you have to melt the materials. You have to, with the lasers, you have to power those high-powered lasers. And you're talking about also about the F, uh, FFC method. How are you going to, well, how do you envisage this? Is it nuclear power initially or what? Yeah. Uh, so I pointed out the Stirling engine. The Stirling engine Can is Can you bring the microphone a bit up? Sorry. The, 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 the Stirling engine is a, uh, converts heat into, um, into power, into electrical power. So we did that research because we were looking at uh, sending it to Mars. On the surface of Mars, it's difficult to operate with solar panels because you have so much dust and, and the solar, solar power available is so much less. So, so Curiosity and, and Perseverance both have radioisotope power sources. So power on the moon during lunar day, there's lots of it, during lunar night is the big deal and surviving the moon and lunar night is, is, is another very big question. So generally, if you're something small, um, you would need some sort of constant heat power, and you're seeing a lot of the, the later rovers, the, the, the Chinese Chang'e 4 mission with its rover, and I can't name, remember the name of the rover, um, they have a small radio isotope heater on board to keep them alive during the, 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 the solar night. So there is uh, power available, um, but you do need a large scale to use the solar power. There's lots of research now into the radioisotope yeah. conversion um, for lots of different missions. Um, and then there's also lots of uh, research into fission as well, nuclear fission. Was that reactor? So the best best acronym I ever ever have ever seen is a NASA project called Krusty, like Krusty the Clown from The Simpsons, which is a kilowatt or a reactor. So you, you're looking, and, and there have been pres presentations uh, today on space-based polar pa power as well for the Earth, um, and. Uh, but yeah. It, if it, I may yeah, just interrupt sorry. because I need to get to the others sorry, as well. No, no. Thank you for that because that's another lecture there. So uh, Beth, we have some very interesting questions for you. I mean, I, we can't answer all of them, but one of them uh, regarding the regolith that you're using from NASA, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Will you be planning to potentially 3D print it if you can? Will you be allowed to do this? Will NASA allow you to do that, the 3D printing process of these regoliths? So as you saw in the, the slides, it's a very small quantity. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, 3, 3D printing is maybe a bit, bit beyond what we can do with that yeah. quantity of material. Um, but in the research proposal, we did include a final, final stage of the experiment yeah. process, which was to, uh, once all of the analysis is done on the, the, the independent materials, the small quantities of independent materials, combine them together into one kind of coherent material, maybe two if we've got enough, and try and uh, cast small small metallic pieces from it. So with that, we can use a, a smaller quantity. Thank you. Stefan, you using lasers to melt these, and you can produce amorphous materials, you can pr produce glasses, you can produce a number of th th you know, things there. But if you're up there on the moon, these lasers, they're going to heat the sample so much, so it gets hot very quickly, and in the atmosphere there, it can cool down very quickly. So there's a thermal shock going from very hot to very cold. Will these things crack? Are they of any use afterwards? Sorry, that's the only scientific question I'm asking. 
Um, yes, um, cracking is definitely a problem, um, but uh, we see during our experiments that we can avoid cracking by choosing the right process parameters depending on the regular composition and also um, it's depending on the melting grade. If you have a high melting grade glass, uh, then you get cracks and if you have sometimes of a zintard uh, body with some um, glass melt and some uh, original particles, then you can nearly avoid cracks. So it just depends on the process parameters and the material you can find for it. And that's why we created this moonrise laser with this broad range of uh, process parameters possible. So it can be avoided and it depends on the um, yeah, what you want to do with the material. Thank you for the brevity of the answer. And a final question for you, Alberto. Uh, it came in very quickly as soon as you finish your talk is that uh, how do you pick the weight of each criterion that you use? Do you assign a weight for each criterion or? So um, the methods as an algorithm to calculate this based on the priority that a group of experts, a multidisciplinary group of experts that can be from uh, risk to uh, more technical fields of uh, the process itself, will uh, we'll give to the, to the criteria. Also in that interaction of one criterion to another, how one criteria influence or is influenced from the other criteria. I read another question that is, was about how many criteria can be, can be treated. And uh, this method can, can have a hierarchical structure with objective, sub-objective, uh, and every sub-objective can have multiple criteria. So, Thank you so much for this that. This is really a complex. Thank you all very much for bringing us back to near time here. But before you go, uh, as Lisa said, uh, initially I represent the Asteroid Foundation, which is a Luxembourg-based foundation. And if I can have the slide up, please, here for a second. We are a foundation which aims to uh, not educate, but to inform decision makers about the importance of space and what can be done in space. But we also have a huge outreach program in Luxembourg, in Europe, and throughout the world to actually educate the next generation of decision makers. And that, for us, is very important. And this year, we're delighted to have two events, one coinciding with Asteroid Day, which is a program from the Asteroid Foundation. Asteroid Day uh, uh, program, uh, some of you may know, uh, a very uh, famous astrophysicist, uh, a lesser-known lesser musician, lesser-known guitarist. His name is Brian May from uh, the group Who, a very famous astrophysicist. Uh, he is the founder of uh, one of the founders of the uh, Asteroid uh, Day events. And that day, that day, on the 30th of June, is generously funded this year by uh, the European Union. And also, on the 1st of July, we have events taking part throughout the day with astronauts, astrophysicists, companies that are involved in uh, the space sector. Uh, we have people who are decision makers there, and it's for the whole families. We have booths there from companies. If you're interested in being part of this event on July the 1st, please see me or one of my colleagues. There's about five of us here from the Asteroid Foundation, and I really look forward to seeing you there sometime, either on the 30th or the 1st or on both days. Thank you so much for that, and thank you, all, all the speakers this morning, eight of you, for really some excellent presentations which highlight the importance of the work that you're doing for sustainable space travel and sustainable uh, human habitation on extraterrestrial surfaces. Thank you very much indeed. Hey.